Okay. Hi, guys. Welcome. Um, tonight, we are going to go over uh, antecedent interventions. My name is Craig DiVincenzo. For those of you that do not know me, uh, I am the program director here at Kaleidoscope Interventions. Uh, I've been here for a little over two years. Um, I'm a board-certified behavior analyst and a mental health counselor, uh, and I have been working with uh, behavior analysis and counseling for about 20 years. Uh, don't tell my colleagues that. Um, but uh, I've worked in uh, schools for children with autism. When I first started, I was fortunate enough to fall into it. Uh, it was one of those situations where I applied for a job right out of college. I took it, and I had no idea that I was at one of the uh, best schools in the state of New Jersey for children with autism and applied behavior analysis, and it caught on to me like that. Um, since then, I've been in uh, residential facilities for adults with uh, developmental disabilities, group homes. Uh, I've worked in vocational settings where we've taught people with autism job skills. Um, I've worked with emotionally and behaviorally disturbed children in uh, psychiatric and uh, psychological facilities. Uh, I think that's pretty much it. Um, and like I said, I've been here now for about two and a half years. Um, and uh, at PuzzleBox and NKI, and, uh, and I love it. Um, tonight, we are going to go through uh, antecedent interventions. Um, the paper that you have uh, will have a set of three questions on it throughout the training. Uh, there'll be stops, there'll be breaks throughout, and it'll ask you three questions. You answer those questions, and you submit that paperwork back uh, to the facility where your child is, and they'll enter it in, and you'll get credit for, for tonight's training. That's typically the way that, that this works and the way that we do it. Um, I'm pretty informal online as well. If you guys have questions, just try to type them in and, and uh, I'll try to get to them as best I can. If you guys have questions here, I will do my best to answer them. Um, if they are very, very specific to your, to your child, um, and uh, then I may just redirect you back to the analyst or someone at the facility that you're at to sort of give you a more um, specific and personal answer. But I will try my best, all right? Um, and with that, let's uh, get started. Okay, so our agenda for tonight, we are going to do three things. We are going to define what antecedent interventions are. Um, we are going to spend the bulk of the time looking at uh, empirically tested antecedent intervention strategies. Um, one of the things that I like about behavior analysis is it's the sort of genius, not that's very complicated, but it's the sort of genius that's really simple. Uh, so when we go through these, they're probably going to be like, oh my god, yeah, that makes so much sense. Um, and that's sort of uh, the reason that I like it. Um, and then at the end, after doing that, we'll have some time hopefully left over for, for questions if you guys have specific questions and things like that. But like I said, if you have them throughout, please feel free to, to ask them and I'll, we'll, we'll pause. Okay, so real quick, what is an antecedent intervention, right? So when we take it, when we break it apart, we're going to look at two things. The word antecedent means what happens before the behavior of interest. And when we talk about interventions, we're talking, talking about things that we do to alter or to change a behavior. So basically, when we talk about antecedent interventions, we're talking about things that we can do before the behavior occurs to make it less likely that the behavior will actually occur. All right, and we're going to spend most of our time focusing on behaviors that we want to decrease or get rid of or don't want to happen. Um, but you could do antecedent inter interventions for things you do want to occur and to happen as well. Um, and a lot of the stuff would sort of just be reversed. All right. Um, <clears throat> so basically our definition is going to be that we are going to manipulate some aspect of the physical or social environment to get a desired behavior to occur. Or in, like I said, for our case tonight, we're going to talk mostly about reducing the likelihood of unwanted behaviors from occurring. All right. Um, Benjamin Franklin once said that an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Um, and then in this situation, that's absolutely correct. What we try to do in the school and in the clinic setting is if we can change the environment and we can alter it to prevent things from occurring, that's even better. That's definitely what we want to do rather than uh, having to intervene and um, and deal with more problematic and, and more dangerous behaviors, if you will, or something like that, all right? 
All right, so before we jump into that, we're gonna just take a quick step back and we're gonna talk about functions um, because antecedent interventions are going to be most effective if they are paired with the function of the problem behavior. So what do I mean by that? So all problem behavior serves a purpose, okay? Uh, it gets a person something or it gets a person out of something. Your four main functions for our simplistic person, um, purposes for tonight are gonna to be escape, attention, tangible, and sensory. So escape means I engage in a behavior to get out of something. Dinner with my in-laws, all right? Uh, I might complain of a stomach ache. I might say I don't feel really well, so that I can say to my wife, you know what, I'm not gonna be able to go to dinner tonight with your parents. Um, that's an escape maintained behavior, okay? My complaining of sickness gets me out of a situation that maybe I don't necessarily want to be in, okay? Um, so, and then there's behavior that's for attention or for what we would call socially mediated reinforcement. So sometimes we do things because we're not being attended to or because we want attention or because um, we're desiring some sort of an interaction. Uh, a th the third function would be tangible and that's an item. So I might engage in a problem behavior because I want cookies or because I want access to an iPad or because something that I did have and wanted was taken away from me, something that ended. Um, and then the last one is sensory or we would call it automatic. Um, and what we're talking about here is that the behavior itself produces some sort of uh, pleasurable um, effect. Okay, some maybe stimming or uh, rocking, vocal, in, um, vocal stereotypy would be sensory or automatically reinforcing in the sense that um, it doesn't necessarily get the person anything from anyone else, but produces an effect that is um, rewarding for that person. Okay, so for the purposes of tonight, we're gonna go through some antecedent interventions and you'll probably see some caveats in my notes that'll say, you know, works better for this function, works better for that function, and so on and so forth. Um, because um, knowing the function is how you uh, deliver and drive an intervention and how you alter behavior. It's really, really hard to do it without knowing that function. Um, because some of these interventions that we'll, we'll go through are gonna actually make it worse if it's the wrong function um, or if it's, if it's not accurate or not correct, okay? All right. <laughs> so this is going to be the list of potential interventions that we're gonna go through today. We're gonna talk about presenting rules, using prompts, uh, a procedure called response interruption and redirection. We're gonna talk about using activity schedules, enriching the environment, uh, distracting, shaping, calming and de-escalation. We're gonna talk about something called the high P procedure. Uh, we're gonna talk about incorporating choices using the pre-MAC principle, um, using high and low demand dispersal, non-contingent reinforcement, social stories, demand fading and priming. Those are gonna be the interventions that we go through. Hopefully you find one of these that either you're already using and you're like, wow, that's great, or you find one that might be useful for you uh, in your, your situations at home, okay? That's my goal for today. So let's jump in. Let's start with presenting rules, okay? Um, so lots of times what happens is that we assume that people know the rules, right? And they know what they should be doing in given certain situations um, and that they should behave in certain ways because they know what to do. We know what they should be doing. Um, the problem is, is that when we assume that or in order to learn that, they have to contact the contingencies associated with that, um, with those reinforcers that are maintaining them. So basically what that means is that in a lot of these situations, people have to fail first if it's not, if there's no, clearly defined rules. Um, and that means that I need to stick my fingers in the electric socket and get the shock before I know, you know what? I shouldn't do that again. Um, when we establish and we can present rules that are clear and well-defined, I don't need to stick my finger in the electric socket, right? Because I know the rule, that's going to hurt. Um, and therefore I don't have to access that actual behavior and I don't need to touch that contingency or that punisher or whatnot. Um, what we find is that lots of children with autism and other developmental disabilities um, 
struggle a little bit uh, with, with understanding the rules. Um, and sometimes they're not always as clear or concise as, uh, as they need to be or as that they should be, and then that they are accessing um, those contingencies and they're failing more often than, than we would want them to. Okay, um, so there are some best practices when you are presenting rules. Um, one of the things I should note is that I'm going to try to do my best with all of these antecedent interventions to explain it for different ages, because I know that you know between here at this facility and Puzzle Box, we have a wide range uh, of ages and things like that. So I'm going to try to go through it, and I will try to give some examples um, for younger children, and I will try to give some examples for potentially for, for older children. Okay. Um, so here what we're talking about, so for best practices, you could involve people in the development of the rules. The idea is, is that research has found that the more involved a person is in a rule, the more likely they are to follow it. Um, so again, um, that may depend upon the age of, the, of, the, of your child, um, but that's certainly one thing that we could do. Um, the other thing that we try to do is, oh, oh I went the wrong. Uh, we try to state the rules positively. Rather than saying, don't do A or don't do B, we try to tell people exactly what we want them to do. Do, you know, do C and do D. The more positive the language, the more do this and do that, um, the, better the, uh, the better the outcome, typically. You want to keep the rules simple and short, right? Nobody wants a giant rule book of things that they need to follow. You want to keep them simple. You want to keep them short. You want to keep them to be the most important things that you need to address and that need to be done in a certain situation. Um, here's an, a, another example where you're going to want to keep the rules developmentally appropriate, right? So if the rule for a two-year-old child might be that, you know, we don't, you know, or we keep our hands to ourselves, right, or, or something like that. Whereas for a 14-year-old, you might have a more complicated rule than that, right? It might be that, um, you know, when we're engaging with friends, we, you know, use polite words and we talk nicely or, you know, or we, we you know, don't use sarcasm or we, whatever it might be. Um, but the idea being that you want to keep them developmentally appropriate. You're not going to have the same set of rules for a two or a four year old that you would for a 15 or 16 year old. All right. Um, <clears throat> Consider a common set of rules. So this one applies more so toward, uh, toward schools than it would necessarily in a, in a home. But typically in the school setting, what we try to do is have a list of rules that are the same for every person in the classroom. Um, we would then individualize them as needed. But in general, we try to keep a common set of rules. Um, you want to teach the rules, OK? You definitely want to teach the rules. And there's lots of different ways that you could teach them. You could teach them. Um, through, you know, we teach them through sometimes through uh, discrete trial interventions, or we might teach them through uh, reading them or writing them or role playing them or situations like that. Um, in the house, you might have uh, opportunities to recall them, repeat them, recite them, and things like that. All right, my kids know that when we sit down at dinner, we review the dinner rules um, for the for the evening. All right, I'm going to sit and eat all my dinner. I'm going to stay in my seat until dinner is over, and all of those sorts of all of those sorts of things. Um, select positive consequences for following the rules. Um, again. Rules are going to be, rules will be great, but they still have to have access to some of the contingencies. So what that means is that I need to get reinforced for following the rules. Um, and it doesn't necessarily need to be a tangible item. I mean, early on it might be tangible items, but then ultimately you could transfer it out, stickers, checks, pluses, high fives, hoorays, Thumbs up, that a boy is all of that sort of stuff. And as the person becomes more familiar with the rules, you can fade it to more natural, um, what we would call rewards or, or reinforcers. Okay. Um, <clears throat> but again, for you know purposes, you absolutely want to make sure that the person has some sort of positive consequence for following the rules. The the more positive consequences they have early on in the development of the rule, the better. And then again, it can be can be faded out. Okay, so this is the first question on your, on your list. Question one, what are some of examples of situations where you might incorporate rules?
And you don't have to answer two, but think about how it might be different if your child was four or if your child was 12. So a situation in your house where you might go back and you might say, hey, I could put in a set of rules during this activity or this time, things like that. I'll give you guys a minute to do that. Okay, so what did you guys come up with? Anybody want to share? You can just shout them out. Go ahead. We have to rule that he's not allowed to open the car door. I have to open it for him. Okay. He has gotten out. Good. Okay. Not in the parking lot. Yep. Mean. Yep. Good. So following, there you have a rule for opening car doors. Perfect. What else? Yeah, you only put poop, pee, and toilet paper in the potty. That's what goes in the potty. Yes, yes, good. Sorry, I don't mean to. I don't mean to laugh, but I'm sure. Yeah, I'm sure it's funny now. I'm sure it's not funny at the time. Yeah. Any others? Good. Good. And another one we do. He's not allowed to jump into or be into the pool. Unless as an adult in the water, not just in the area. Good. Great. Perfect. Good. So those are so you can see the benefit, like even just in those examples, right? Of of having um, of having those behaviors be under the control of a rule rather than the contingencies, right? We don't want to touch those contingencies of running out the car door, running into the parking lot flushing things down the toilet. Um, all of those sorts of things are, are definitely behaviors that we want under the control of a rule, right? Or, um, yeah, like, no hitting or keeping body parts to yourself. Yes, keeping hands and body parts to yourself. Absolutely, again, right? Because that's one where you don't want to contact the potential contingencies of putting your hands on the wrong person at the wrong time, right? Very good, okay. So the next one we're going to talk about is using prompts. All right, so we're going to talk about what prompts are. Um, so a prompt is a stimulus that, um, so the technical definition is a prompt is a stimulus that occasions a behavior to occur. All right, it's an additional stimulus that's added in, right? So basically a prompt is a reminder uh, in, in the simplest terms, okay, um, for things to occur. So um, typically when we talk or when people see prompts, they think of actual response prompts like physical guidance or hand over hand prompting or things like that. Um, when we talk about it in terms of, um, when we talk about it in terms of antecedent interventions for problem behavior, we're talking about what are called uh, stimulus prompts. So they are things that I add to the environment to remind you to do something or to not do something. Okay, we all have them. They're all over the place for us. There's sticky notes in my wallet, you know, to make sure that I stop at the grocery store on the way home. I've got reminders on my phone to make sure that I pick up my kids on time and leave work when I'm supposed to. All of those things are prompts, okay? Uh, some other examples, um, you might put a picture of a new outfit on a refrigerator. That's a prompt to not eat all the ice cream, right? Or uh, there's safety signs uh, out in the environment. Every one of the safety signs is a prompt to engage in or to not engage in a behavior, right? A speed limit posting is a prompt to slow down, 
all right? Uh, the car seatbelt beep, one of the most annoying things in the entire world, right, is a prompt to put your seatbelt on, right? Um, so all of these things are really, really effective. Uh, by adding additional stimuli into the environment, you're able to either alter or change behavior. Timers, uh, lines on a classroom rug, right, or something like that, outlines on a rug, like this is the area that you play in, this is this area. We have, uh, we've got foam mats at our house. They're like little puzzle piece foam mats that we stick together, and that's our Lego area. Your Legos stay on the foam mat, that's your prompt. Otherwise, I step on them and I break my legs, right? Um, music for transitions, to start something, to stop something, you might use music. Um, cues and social interactions. We've taught people to engage in social interactions using, um, using recordings um, to sort of to say something. We've taught people to engage in social interactions with a recording. We've taught people to um, respond to being lost in the community with a motivator. So it's like a, it's like a beeper or a vibrator and you set it to a certain time and we've actually taught uh, young adults with autism who are, who were quite impaired um, to when the motivator went off, when they were lost to go and to look for someone. Um, and then what we did was we just faded out the motivator um, and we were able to teach people to pair the motivator with being lost and that they were then able to go and find, you know, a community person or a police officer to say that they were lost and to show an ID. So using prompts can be a really, really valuable tool um, in terms of um, occasioning or stopping certain behaviors. Okay, the next one is a, is a procedure called response interruption and redirection. Um, so basically what this involves in, and it's, it's considered an antecedent intervention, but it's, it's sort of as the behavior is occurring or about to occur. And basically what happens is you interrupt the person from engaging in the behavior, and then you combine it with a prompt to engage in a more appropriate alternative behavior, right? So um, here's an example where this is a, this is a, um, an antecedent intervention that works best for attention or for tangible functions, right? So it doesn't work as well for escape or for, um, it could work for sensory as well, but not as well for escape. Um, so examples might be uh, in the research that I found was redirecting pica to more uh, appropriate food choices. So in some of the research studies, they were able to teach children who engage in pica and would eat things, inedible objects off the floor. They were able to interrupt that response and replace it with a more appropriate going to get something from the refrigerator and to eat something, right? So um, by, by using this procedure, they were able to significantly reduce incidence of pica, um, which again, behaviorally is a really significant problem behavior and you would, you would wanna be able to have that reduced. Um, it's most commonly used for vocal stereotyping. So if a child is engaged in um, humming, singing, echoalia, recoil of a, of a um, recall of a, uh, of a certain video or song or movie that they, that they like that's not socially appropriate at that time, um, what you do is you interrupt it um, and then you replace it with more appropriate language. You know, say hello, say hi, how are you? Um, something like that. Okay, um, and it's also used for um, for non-compliance behavior. So if somebody's engaged in non-compliance, you you interrupt the non-compliance, and then you try to replace it with something um, more appropriate. Research has been successful there. I have a short video; it's only 12 seconds long, um, of a very very basic um, response interruption and redirection procedure, and I hope you can hear it. I didn't test it on the machine. Uh, of course not. Oh, there we go. Hands ready. Good job. Good. So obviously, really short, really simple. But the idea here is that. Oh no, that's not the one I want. Go over to the next slide. There we go. All right. Almost pulled up something I'm not supposed to there. Um, so the idea here is, is that the person's engaged in in that video. They're engaged in a motor stereotypy. They interrupt it. Do this. Do this, do this, hands flat, right? So we interrupt the uh, the motor activity and get it to a more appropriate behavior of, of doing this, All right? It also combines another procedure which we're going to go over in a in a little bit. 
Okay, so the next one I want to go over briefly is activity schedules. Do any of you guys use activity schedules with your kids at, at home where like you give them a list of things to do and basically they go and they do them, you use them? Okay. Um, when I worked at the school years and years and years ago, I taught all of the kids to follow activity schedules um, just for, I mean, we really did it for like respite for, for families so that a child could go for a half an hour and go entertain and engage themselves for a period of time um, and, and do independent activities. Um, but basically here what we're talking about uh, in an activity schedule is it, it's really just a list of things to do. Um, the ones that we have here, I did two. I, did, I showed one that's written and one that is pictorial. Um, and basically the way that I've usually seen them and I find them most effective is you have a to do and then a done list and basically you teach the person to either cross it out when it's done or to move it over to the next to the next slide um, or to move it over and you could do it with pictures. The child does not have to be able to read in order to do activity schedules. As a matter of fact, the ones that we all taught were all picture activity schedules. Um, you could pair it with timers and amount of time and we used to teach the child to um, engage in whatever the activity was, puzzles, set a timer, and then go do puzzles for that period of time, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, whatever it was. Uh, we were able to get some of the kids on pretty long activity schedules where they were um, engaged in appropriate uh, independent activities. So, you know, you could make dinner or sit for five minutes, right? Um, those sorts of things. Um, typically for, for activity schedules, you would need to teach them. You start them usually pretty small and then you build them up over time. Um, if it's something that you are interested in having help with, you could reach out to the analysts at the program. They certainly help you guys sort of create and make activity schedules that would be appropriate for, for your kids, things like that. Um, we taught some of our adults to do independent activity schedules on their phones. Um, basically like you or I would put in a calendar event, set the timer for it, and then move on to the next one when it was, when it was done. Um, and again, we found them to be um, effective and useful. All right, so question number two, can you guys think of a, a situation in which you might use an independent activity schedule? What happened? Bedtime. Yeah, bedtime routine, right? So we've taught lots of times, we've taught our kids to follow independent activity schedules during, uh, oh, we're all gonna be getting that, I guess, huh? Um, so yeah, we've taught some of the kids to do independent activity schedules during bedtime routines, right? So brush your teeth, um, put on your pajamas, wash your face, read a book, go to bed. Yep. My kid, yeah, go ahead. I combined a clock with that. Yeah. So it's all colorful. Yes, absolutely. Yep. So for depending upon, you can make it as simple or as complicated as you'd like. You can pair it with clocks. You can pair it with timers. You, like I said, we've done it with people on their phones for more complex ones and things like that. Um, my kids have activity schedules for the morning time. All right. So for when they get up in the morning, they've got an activity schedule on the wall, and it basically says, make your bed, brush your teeth, you know, comb your hair, put on your socks, come downstairs for breakfast. Um, and for them to be able to do as much of that as they possibly can uh, as independently as as independently as possible while I do mine. <laughs> uh, can you guys think of any others? What else did you what else did you come up with? Yep. So like a pre, yep. Yeah, so like a pre-bed routine, same sort of thing. Yeah, an, an activity, an afternoon activity schedule. Absolutely. Yeah. Any others? Those are the most, you know, those are the most common ones. Um, grocery shopping is a good place to do activity schedules. If you, if you, you know, if you have a hard time, if your, if your son or daughter has difficulty in the grocery store or anything like that, you can make an activity schedule for grocery. It's basically a grocery list, um, and there's ways that you can incorporate reinforcement, you know, before or after and things like that. Um, any social activity or event is another good one. We used to do it for parties for people. We would, you know, the adults that I worked with had difficulty in social settings and had difficulty at parties and family events, so we would make them activity schedules to sort of follow and go through. Um, 
for whatever reason, the, 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 the adults that I worked with who were, who were pretty classic, you know, the pretty classic autism, um, really did well with activity schedules and when things were structured out and routinized and, and stuff like that, um, made those more, um, uh, made those more abstract sort of activities and things like that more concrete and more palatable and, and manageable and stuff like that. All right. Okay, so let's talk about enriching the environment. Okay, so um, the more access to reinforcing activities, the less likely we are to see problem behavior, right? If I'm happy, I don't engage in problem behavior. So the more fun and active, uh, I'm sorry, the more fun and the more reinforcing activities there are, the less likely you are to get problem behavior. So the more attention, you're gonna let less uh, behavior maintained by attention. The more successful or rewarding an activity is, the less you're gonna get for escape. If I'm good at it and I'm successful at it, I'm probably not gonna wanna quit or escape it or avoid it, okay? Um, and the same goes for sensory. Um, what tends to compete with sensory activities is highly reinforcing uh, activities um, and things to do, all right? So the more involved in engaging those are, the better. That's a pretty, pretty straightforward one. Uh, distracting with preferred items, okay? So, so basically what we're talking about here is if you're faced with a situation that you know is going to cause a problem behavior, right? It's a, what we would call a, uh, a trigger, right? So it's a trigger for a problem behavior. Fire alarm goes off, I know that that's gonna trigger somebody's problem behavior, right? Or somebody being, yep, yeah, you can say something, yeah. So the, the um, other peers provoking, stuff like that, siblings provoking, right? I know that when my daughter starts annoying my son that there's gonna be a pretty good chance that I'm gonna get some sort of problem behavior here, right? I know that those are pretty standard triggers. So what you can do is you can provide access to reinforcing items when that trigger occurs to sort of transition through the more challenging situation, okay? so. It works best when you can identify pretty reinforcing activities, and it works best when the problem behavior is not maintained by a reinforcing activity. So what I mean by that is this intervention does not work when I know that the trigger is because I took away your iPad, okay? That, that's not the time for this, because that's, that problem behavior that I get when I take away your iPad is maintained by access to that iPad, right? And I don't really have anything that competes with that. Um, so in that situation, I might have to think of another antecedent intervention, not necessarily this one, okay? Um, some examples that I found in, in literature. Um, so there was a study where they decreased problem behavior during meals out for a seven-year-old boy by providing reinforcing activities during the meal, all right? Coloring books, activities, things like that, fun games, all of those sorts of stuff, um, was able to reduce problem behavior during mealtime out by making the environment, um, by distracting them with uh, more preferred and reinforcing activities, okay? Um, <clears throat> and for food refusal is another way that, they, that this uh, intervention has been successful. Um, so um, for children that are you're trying to increase the amount of food intake or you're trying to increase the variety of intake, if you offer a competing reinforcer during that meal time, the research says that it increases, um, it increases the, um, the behavior of eating non-preferred foods and stuff like that. All right. Okay. The next one is shaping. Okay, so sometimes um, this one is for when I'm gonna take that iPad away, okay? So this is for the one where I know that I'm going to be terminating a preferred activity, right? I know that something that you're really enjoying is gonna come to an end, and I want to mitigate the problem behavior associated that typically comes when I take that item away, right? But I have to take it away. Um, so what we've been able to do sometimes is to have an intermediate activity um, where we go from something really awesome to something not so bad to something that I really don't want to do, right? So under normal circumstances, it's turn off the iPad, it's time to go have dinner, or turn off the iPad, it's time to go take a bath, right? Um, which evokes the problem behavior because I'm going from something really, really fun to I don't really want to take a bath. Um, but what you sometimes can do is do something in between that sort of 
breaks the fall, if you will, all right? So uh, one example that I had is that I worked with a gentleman who um, was pretty significantly impaired, um, and he engaged in very high rates of aggression, um, and he was big. Um, and what we, were, what we found was is that when lunchtime ended, he had to go back to doing his schoolwork or his classwork, and it, ev it evoked high rates of intense problem behavior. All right, it was a very difficult transition to go from lunch to something like that. Uh, so what we did was is we reached out to, to mom and we said, do you have something that he'll eat? It's not his favorite thing in the whole world, but he'll reliably eat it. And she's like, apples. We're like, great, do me a favor. I need you to bring in apples um, for, us to, for us to use. So what we did was is we, we created, we shaped it back and we created that intermediate uh, activity, right? So. Now, lunch is over, and I say, okay, bud, lunch is over. Take your apple and go sit down at your desk. And you can eat your apple at your desk. And we pretty quickly got, sure, this sounds pretty cool. I take my apple, I go sit down, I eat my apple, then I'm able to introduce the work activities because I've gotten that intermediate step with some reinforcement. Um, and this is a fairly... Um, successful intervention in those situations. So to try to think of things, um, you know, we do we use puzzles and we use books, which are not crazy reinforcing. But if I'm going from the iPad to here, take this book, let's go sit down and read it. You know, it's more fun than going back to work. Um, but then I'm back at the table where I need to do work, and it makes that transition smoother and easier. Okay, um, so. That's the example of shaping. Uh, the next one is something called the high probability request. Um, and the high probability request, you sort of saw a little bit before when we did the last video. I have a video of it here. It's not my favorite video of it, but I'm going to show it to you anyway. Um, and basically what we do here is this one is pretty good for non-compliance. So if I'm not, if I'm having difficulty um, with an instruction or a direction, okay? Um, it works better before the problem behavior occurs. So if I know that I'm going to something that is likely to be um, refused or not complied with, like it's time to go take a bath, um, you can implement this procedure. And behaviorally, basically what we do is I identify the low pro probability task, it's go upstairs and take a bath, right? So that's the one I've identified. I know that that's probably gonna be not complied with. I'm probably gonna have a problem with it. Okay, so what I do is I give four or five high probability requests. So they are things that you are really likely to comply with. They're easy, they're fast, and I can discreetly do them pretty quickly. Lots of times we do what's called gross motor imitation. Do this, do this, do this. Um, or one-step directions where it's touch your nose, clap your hands, you know, what's your name, where do you live, sorts of things. Um, after I give the four or five, I provide praise for compliance of each of those four or five. Good, that's right, nice job, excellent, looks good. Um, and then I give the low probability request. All right, let's go upstairs and take a shower. Um, it's based off of the principles of behavioral momentum, and then I provide higher rate of reinforcement for completing the low-level task. Um, for the, I'm sorry, for the low demand, um, the low probability task, the one that you're not likely to enjoy doing, all right? So basically what it does is it builds momentum. What we find is that behaviorally speaking, when you get certain, when you're getting compliance, the more compliance you get, the more likely you are to comply with the next request, all right? Um, and like I said, I have, a, I have a short video of it. It's not my favorite one, but you'll, you'll get a chance to see it. I don't think she picks the best high probability behaviors, but that's what I could find. You got a high five. That was so good. Here's your 
OK, so um, not my favorite example, because I, I mean, quite frankly, who has bubbles laying around the house all the time, right? And Duke, oh my goodness, OK, all right. There you go, so you can do that one. Yeah, um, <laughs> uh, or you know, things like that. But the, you, you get the idea, hopefully, from it, four or five things that the person's likely to comply with, and then the one that they're not likely to, right? She's going to have a problem when she asks him to pause the video. She knows that in advance, tries to use behavioral momentum. Um, OK, the next one is choices. Um, so research, I, I actually really, I, this was my favorite part to sort of prepare for, because uh, I was fascinated by the research regarding choices. Um, so research suggests that providing people with choices can increase compliance with non-preferred tasks, right? Seems to make the most amount of sense. Um, so one study that I found gave students the option to complete two different math assignments. One was the regular assignment that the rest of the staff had to complete. The other one was an assignment where the question was on the front and the answer was on the back, right? So what do you think they found? Which one did the students choose? The answer on the back. I thought so too, but they actually found that the students always picked the regular assignment, which I found interesting. Yeah, yeah. I thought it was pretty, pretty interesting. They always picked the standard assignment. Um, other research found that being allowed to choose the sequence of tasks in completes, uh, I'm sorry, increases compliance, right? So we have to do these five things. There's no way around it. We need to do these five things, but I don't care what order we do them. So you get to pick what order we do the five things. We can do A, then B, and then D, and then E, right? Or whichever way that we want to do it. Um, and then this was my favorite. So some research even suggested that when identical consequences are provided, right? So the, the consequence for um, both the choice and the no choice condition was exactly the same. People rated preferring the choice condition better. So even when the outcome ends up being exactly the same, you get the cookie for doing it, you get the $100 for doing it, you get the same amount, people preferred having a choice. Um, which was which was fascinating, right? Um, when I do topics and trainings about choice, I think sometimes people misunderstand what choice means. It doesn't mean you can do whatever you want. It doesn't mean you can do it however you want, right? Um, you can provide choices of how, you can provide choices of when, you can provide choices of where, you can provide choices of with who, okay? Um, it doesn't necessarily mean a choice of, of everything. Right? I don't have a choice of everything in the world. Right? That's not realistic. We don't have that. But we have certain choices mixed in throughout. Um, and the more choices that we can offer, um, you know, the more choices that we can offer people, the more likely we are to get compliance and things like that. Right? So again, it also is going to vary very much by age in terms of what choices are allowed and what choices are not allowed and things like that. All right. Any questions? Okay. So the premac principle is our next one. This one, this one's oftentimes called grandma's rule. Um, it's really a very, very simple concept. It's a very basic if-then contingency. If you do A, then we can do B. So the idea is you put you have two tasks. One's not terribly preferred. One's very highly preferred. And basically, what I do is I say first we eat the carrots, then you can have the cupcake. All right, and you just lay out that contingency. Um, not terribly complicated, pretty straightforward, pretty simple. Um, but basically, the idea is, is that we provide a reinforcing activity after we provide, after we complete the not so reinforcing contingency. All right, fairly straightforward there. All right, um, the next one is high and low demand dispersal. Okay, so what this says is that research tells us that. When tasks are too difficult, we're not going to do them. But at the same time, when tasks are too easy, we're not going to do them. Um, and what research has found is that if we mix in hard and simple, hard and simple, hard and simple, not only do people prefer that, but they actually do more during the task. Uh, they accomplish more, they stay on task more, and they have higher retention rates, they learn it better, and they become more fluent with it. Um, so when we're giving demands or tasks or activities, right, if we're making an activity schedule, you want to intersperse 
things that are a little bit more challenging, right, or a little bit less preferred with things that are more preferred, easier to do, and so on and so forth. Um, that interspersal of demands of difficult and easy um, can make compliance more effective. Okay. Um, the next one we're going to talk about is called non-contingent reinforcement. Um, so, so the the um, the technical definition here is that I provide a reinforcer um, regardless of your behavior. Uh, basically, I give it to you for free. Okay. So you have to identify the function, like we said before, right? So if I determine that a problem behavior is caused by escape. What I do is I try to determine when the escape occurs, and then I give the ability to escape before the problem behavior occurs. Okay, so um, I'll give you the best example, the clearest example I can give you is in a in a classroom setting, but it's applicable at home as well. But it's easier to understand in this example. So in a classroom setting, I determine that during math time, a child engages in problem behavior every five minutes to get out of doing math. They rip up the paper, they throw the pencils, whatever the behavior is, doesn't matter. We determine they do it every five minutes, right? I can tolerate about five minutes of math before I start flipping out. Well, non-contingent reinforcement says, at four minutes, I'm gonna give you a break, okay? Um, and basically, the idea is, is I give you what you're looking for so you don't have to engage in that problem behavior, all right? Um, and then what you start to do is you start to increase the amount of time that the task needs to be done before they get access to that reinforcer, all right? Um, and the idea here is that I can give you what you're looking for so you don't have to engage in that problem behavior. Um, Non-contingent reinforcement has certain advantages and it has certain disadvantages. The advantages is pretty easy to do, right? Because you can deliver the reinforcer beforehand. The disadvantages are you need to know the function, and it doesn't teach anything. So that's the, that's the other disadvantage. Is I'm not teaching you how to manage that, that difficulty. I'm not teaching you how to appropriately get out of that situation because I'm giving it to you for free. Um, so typically when we use non-contingent reinforcement, and we will use it a lot in a, in, a, in a clinical intervention, we use it as part of a treatment package. So I would combine it with other things to you know, increase your ability to, to ask for breaks and, and so on and so forth. Um, but I wanted to give you guys a heads up because it's something that you know, I, is, is really useful and can be very effective to at least minimizing that problem behavior. Um, I find it particularly useful in public situations. All right, so if I know that I can make it this far in public, well, then maybe I can give access to the reinforcer before that problem behavior occurs, right, so that I don't have to deal with it and manage it in, in that type of a, a situation. Okay, um, social stories is the next one. Are you, anybody guess familiar with social stories? Have you heard that term before? No? Yes, a little bit? Okay, so basically what a social story is is it's um, – it's a written procedure or it's a picture procedure that explains a situation to a child. Um, and it's, 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 written in a certain, um, it's written in a certain manner. It's usually written in the first person and it answers questions for the child about a given situation. It might answer who, it might answer what, it might answer why, when, all that sort of stuff. Um, typically it'll include the reactions of other people. When you do X, other people might feel Y. Um, and it sort of makes it a little bit more concrete, some of the more abstract and difficult social situations. Um, and it may have pictures or videos. I have a very brief, hopefully it works, example of a social story. Uh, of course not. All right, well, I can get you one if you're interested in it. I can send you one. But basically it's written out uh, in the format that explains, uh, explains a certain situation um, to the child. Go back. Yeah, of course. I think. All right, so you might have a social story, for example, for like going to the dentist. So, you know, um, and it's written in the first person. So Craig is going to the dentist tomorrow. When Craig goes to the dentist, he's going to sit in the dentist's chair. Uh, the dentist is going to use a bright light and look in Craig's eye, you know, look in Craig's mouth. He might use scary looking instruments. Uh, you know, at, at some points it might hurt. If it hurts, I raise my hands and tell the dentist I need a break or something like that, okay, um, are some examples of, of social stories. Did you get, you know, 
All right, um, the next one is reducing response effort. So basically the principle here is that the harder a behavior is physically to do, the less likely we are to do it. Um, so what we want to do is we measure the, we get an idea of how much effort it takes to engage in the problem behavior, and then we try to replace it with something that's easier to do. So <laughs> the example here is um, they, this one here, they, uh, they examined the effects of asking for a break compared to problem behavior. Right, so they had two conditions. The first one was they taught the child a very simple response. The child just went like this, break. Okay, didn't have to say anything, just did this. Um, and then they, they in, that, in that situation, because this behavior was easy to do, when they compared it to problem behavior, problem behavior went way down, asking for a break went way up. Okay, when they had a more complicated response that basically made the child say, I'd really like to take a break, please, if one is available, Right? That's a long response effort. That takes a lot of work and a lot of effort to do, so that did not replace the problem behavior. In that condition, the child engaged in the same rates of problem behavior as they did in the, in the, in like the baseline or like the original situation. All right? So the easier we make a replacement behavior, uh, the, the more likely it is to be effective. All right, so question number three, the last one, what is one way we can reduce the response effort to decrease challenging behavior? And you think of a way that you can make something easier to do so that you don't get a problem behavior. All right, now as you're writing them real quick, what do you got? Do you have any examples? This question was a little harder. <laughs> yes? Did you have one? Oh, okay. Anybody giving me one? Don't leave me hanging. How could you make getting ready for dinner easier? How could you make getting ready for bed easier, right? If those are the situations in which you have problem behavior because it takes a lot of response effort, it takes a lot of non-compliance, what's a way you can make it easier? Like for us, dinner time, sometimes we play, we have a dinner music playlist. Okay. We have on Spotify that we play. And Good. Especially with our younger one, when he's getting started out, right? He has his favorite song that he hears when we play it. Good. And then, Good. Good. Perfect example. That's a good example. He sees it and he turns it on. Perfect. It's an example of a couple of them, right? That's an example of uh, redirecting it with something more reinforcing and an example of making the response effort easier, right? Easier now to come and sit down. Um, so with my kid, oh, did you have one? Okay, good. Good. So you have an you make the response effort of calming down easier by by providing a, a thing like that. Good. So I'll, uh, so again, for for my example, it's the morning routine, right? So in order to decrease response effort in the morning, we pick out our clothes the night before, and I lay them out for my daughter, right? So now she's not standing in front of the closet for 25 minutes while I have to get her on the bus to get to school um, and all of that sort of stuff. Okay. So I make the behavior easier to do. I make it easier for you to get dressed. Yep. Yes. Yeah. Good example. Good. Another example of of both reducing response effort and of uh, you know of rep of using something to, uh, to to distract. Right. I'm bringing another reinforcer in to distract during that problem behavior. Um, I'm going to quickly go through priming. Um, so priming is an intervention where basically we explain. All right, we just explain it. We prime the person. We get them ready. It's like your first coat of paint, right? I get them ready for the uh, for the activity. I explain the expectations. 
okay? Uh, they're usually pretty short, they're pretty concise. Um, if I've got the actual materials, I might use the actual materials. So you gave the example of going to the barber. I might prime, okay, we're gonna go to the barber today. Okay, These, he's gonna use the clippers. Here's a video of it. This is somebody getting a haircut. This is what they do. This is how I want you to sit. All of that sort of stuff. When you're done, you're gonna get a lollipop, all that sort of good stuff, all right? Um, those are all examples of priming, sort of explaining that situation. All right, so the other one is de-escalation and calming techniques. You had already touched upon this with the pillow and things like that. So sometimes we teach replacement behaviors, right? So sometimes we might teach some de-escalation or some calming procedures. Um, can you, de what, what de-escalation techniques and calming procedures do your kids use? What have you taught? Breathing, right? That's a simple one, good. Any others? We have a happy box area that he goes. Good. Good. So you got a spot to sort of just go and hang out, your own space, some privacy, that sort of stuff? Cool. Yeah. Okay. So, so, okay. so yeah, right? Okay, good. Yep. Yeah. So so there's so basically when you teach de-escalation and calming techniques, you want to try to have ones um, either very specific, like you guys have there in the house, or other ones that are really, really general, like deep breathing, counting to five, all of that sort of stuff, so I could use it and where any time both are okay you just obviously just you know you know uh, what you need and, and and stuff like that it's perfect um, hands and pockets blow into your hands at PBA one of my favorite ones is uh, smell your flowers blow out your candle right slow in breathe out all of that sort of stuff making fists and then relaxing it some sort of uh, de-escalation procedures and things like that all right that was all that I had, and I, I did okay, not too bad. What, uh, what questions do you guys have? Um, could be very similar, yes. You could prime with a social story, um, you, but in priming, it depends, upon, it depends upon the child. You could just do it verbally, you might do it with a video, um, but yes, they are, a social story is a type of priming. Yep. Well, yeah, I always tell her exactly yep. what we're going to do and yep. go on because she's. Yeah, because it's anxiety, right? Because for a lot of people, yeah, it's anxiety provoking. Inside. Yep. She it out here, she Internalizes it. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. yeah. Yeah, and then she does this like meltdown where she just turns red and she can't cope. cope. Yeah. Yeah. She can't even. Yeah. <laughs> Yep. Yeah. Sort of giving that. Yeah. Well, that's what it is. Yeah. I mean, that's really exactly what it is. Yeah. Giving those things like that. Yeah. So is this something like behavior issues? Is this something that they'll grow out of as they get older, or is this something these what we what we're doing here teaching them? Is this something they're going to learn to rely on and be dependent on going into their teens, late teens, or whatever? Like you talk about you know, my daughter, I pick out her clothes, we just stand it. Right. Is that something that she's gonna rely on for however long and then right. at some point is that gonna so, cause the rip to Right. So um what I will tell you is that it is like I'll give you the basic, the general answer, right? And that is autism is a spectrum disorder. And you're gonna have wide arrays of behaviors, of outcomes, um you know, some people with, you know, autism are going to go on to live, you know, I hate to use the word normal lives, but, you know, have a high functioning quality job, you know, but manage socially, do all of that sort of stuff. Um, and, and then you've got the other extreme, right? So, and then it's just like, it's like anything else with, with the, um, with the diagnosis, it's, it's going to be a spectrum. It's going to be, I can't tell you that answer. Um, I wish I could, but I, I can't tell you. Um, I worked with some people who these things are their way of managing life. Um, and they need them, and the more antecedent interventions like we can put in place, then the less help they need outside, right? So I, I, tell you, I worked in group homes and things like that. We tried to do as many antecedent interventions so that they had less reliance on, you know, staff support and, and things like that in the group home. Um, and uh, it just, um, I, I, wish I, had a, I wish I had a better answer, but I, I, I don't. It's gonna depend. 
Yes. So with this one of the yeah. Uh, I think the function would be sensory, you would all Yeah. Probably. You would you have any advice to the connect to the door? Right. No, you can't ignore it. No. <laughs> nope, you, you can't ignore it. Um uh you, off the top of my head, I mean, yeah, um, off the top of my head, you're probably going to provide uh, competing things. So high rates of attention for other things. Um, maybe all, I, I, you know, I don't know what it would be. Um, but high rates of, of attention maybe for other chores or something. I mean, you know, depending upon age and stuff like that, right? High rates of attention for other chores, taking out the garbage, stuff like that. Like other ways to get... Woohoo, that's awesome. Um, and then other ways to meet that sensory need. So, good. Yeah, so there you go, right? Like to watch it flush down the toilet, right? Or, you know, coloring it with dye or something like that, right? That's less, you know, and then you could fade that out, right? So sometimes you, behaviorally, you can't go from 60 miles an hour to a dead stop, right? Sometimes you gotta take steps along the way, and while maybe you're, you're you're not looking for the best, you know, that's not your ultimate outcome, right? But maybe it's better than the one that you're kind of dealing with now and then can work on it from there. Um, but again, reach out to the, reach out to the analysts and they, they yeah, they, they might be able to help and, and give more suggestions. But definitely finding an alternative sensory thing. I worked with one gentleman, he used to urinate on himself and he used to dump all water and things on him. And we were like, why is this going on? It's automatic. He likes the way it sort of covers him. Uh, and we taught him to do the laundry and it worked. He would take, and it would take him hours to do the laundry, but who cared? Uh, he would take the laundry detergent and pour it on every piece of clothes and just, you know, sensory, enjoy watching the color, you know, the, but we found something that was more appropriate than, than the behavior that we were, we were doing. Yeah. You're welcome. The potty is not a playbook. You don't go into the bathroom unless you're potty nuts. Also, Your role. Yeah. Like doors are shut. You want to go to the potty? You tell me, and I will get yeah. in there for you. We've done that with all three of our kids. We just don't want to have to. Uh, yeah. You don't go to the potty without me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you wait, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, there's other there's other stuff you can do too. Like so, you can you know there's ways that you can potentially signal it. Like it's okay to go in there now. It's not okay. But like you know, I mean, there's there's he really there's a number of things that you could do. You would have to find the one that's going to be, you know, the most successful and appropriate for for you and for, you know, okay. and Colton. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Thank yeah.